If you're looking to brew an IPA that's not like all the rest, check out Dick Cantwell's newest book, Brewing Eclectic IPA, Pushing the Boundaries of India Pale Ale. Award-winning brewer Cantwell includes 25 original IPA recipes and categorizes over 200 unique ingredients to spice up your IPA, from papaya to peppercorn, beets to bog myrtle, and cannabis to cocoa nibs. Order your copy of Brewing Eclectic IPA by Dick Cantwell at brewerspublications.com or wherever books are sold. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 31st, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, brewer and author Dick Cantwell talks about his new book, Brewing Eclectic IPA, Pushing the Boundaries of India Pale Ale. In the book, Dick shares recipes envisioning IPAs with fruit, vegetables, herbs, spices, coffee, chocolate, wood, and other things. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com as well, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment there, they say that new listeners will find us that way. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Well, Steve Wilkes and I finished shooting a behind-the-scenes video about the pale ale that I brewed using leftover hops from our first two hop sampler episodes. Uh, We usually sample those kinds of beers on Basic Brewing Video for everybody to see, but for the first time... We drank all of this one before we had a chance to sample it on the show. So (laughs) all I have is a still picture of the beer. Uh, So, But I I do have the footage that I shot of the brewing process itself. Uh, And Steve and I got together at Steve's Brew Shop this week to recall what the beer tasted like. We we did a little reenactment there, you know, with, with no beers in hand. Uh, reenacting what what our reactions were to tasting the beer. So, um, (laughs) sorry about that. Uh, But I'm putting all of that together for a behind-the-scenes video that will only be available for paid subscribers, uh, legacy PayPal subscribers, and Patreon subscribers of $5 or more. And uh, uh, Patreon subscribers of $2 or more will get the recipe that I used. Uh, This is the first time that we've done a paid-only video uh, since our bonus cooking videos of of years past. So uh, don't worry, we've got some more beers waiting in the wings to make uh, basic brewing episodes uh, for the uh, general public's consumption. Here's another shameless uh, plug alert, or not shameless pug. Those are cute dogs, but that's not what this is. It's a shameless plug alert. Uh, There is a new product coming to the basic brewing shop. Uh, I've ordered uh, silicone pint glasses just in time for camping. They're uh, multicolored tie-dye sort of things with the uh, Basic Brewing logo on the side. Uh, They're actually being shipped right now, so I haven't seen them in person. Uh, However, I have seen a similar one that I got at a state park uh, nearby here, and uh, I've been using it, and it's pretty cool. It's perfect for camping, because uh, you know, you, if you drop your pint glass, it's not going to shatter all over the uh, all over the rocks and stuff. So check social media in the next week or two, uh, and I'll let you know when they are out. You've heard me talk about um, my rosemary IPA that I brewed using one of Dick Cantwell's uh, eclectic IPA recipes as an inspiration. Uh, and one thing that you'll notice in the new book is that Dick recommends yeast from our sponsor, Imperial Organic Yeast. Uh, And I think that this is the first brewing book where Imperial is listed. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, Imperial Yeast is is great stuff. And they're a a sponsor of the show. They offer the highest cell count of any liquid yeast producer with 200 billion cells. Uh, Since I've been using Imperial, I've pretty much said goodbye to making starters for standard gravity five-gallon batches. My my stir plate here uh, is is getting dusty. Uh, Imperial will be releasing four seasonals each year, and they'll be available for two months at a go. Uh, The first seasonal that they're rolling out is A30 Corporate. 
available June and July, so look forward to that. A30 Corporate is a clean ale strain, great for producing a wide variety of beers, especially IPAs, which is appropriate. Its aroma profile accentuates many of the newer and fruitier hop varietals. Should be a great choice for the new Brute IPA style that you heard uh, Chris Colby talk about on this show. And Imperial Yeast is based in Portland, Oregon, where HomebrewCon is going to be in June. So Imperial is hosting an insane on the yeast strain kickoff party for HomebrewCon at the Imperial Bottle Shop on Wednesday, June 27th at 6 p.m. It's in collaboration with Everybody's Brewing out of White Salmon, Washington, and will feature feature eight beers, all brewed with the same base wort, but inoculated with eight different yeast strains, which sounds like a lot of fun. Steve and I are planning to be there. We hope to see you there, too. It's a non-ticketed event, so first come, first serve. And uh, thanks to Imperial Organic Yeast for their support of this podcast, and we look forward to meeting them in person. Portland is coming up. HomebrewCon is coming up. Um, And uh, as you probably know, we're taking the month of June off from posting audio episodes, Um, but I'm planning to post a video episode or two. Uh, I I don't know about you, but uh, when I've got a big trip coming up, I start to have dreams about the trip. Wrangling gear, you know, packing suitcases, gathering audio and video equipment together, making arrangements, trying to meet planes. Yeah. By the time I wake up, I feel I've I've already put in a day of work, and uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot. It's a lot of fun at HomebrewCon, but, it, but for us, it is a lot of work. Uh, there's a ton of stuff to do uh, with all the presentations and club night and meeting up to record material for shows. And we uh, we typically come home with around two months worth of episodes. So. I'm really hoping that we can do that again. Um, we, uh, we're we going to ship some beers out there, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can do a, a version of the Hop Sampler show while we're out there and uh, and get some people uh, other than us to, to taste some of these beers. Uh, and speaking of HomebrewCon, our sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa are giving away a Werthog 10-gallon two-vessel electric system at HomebrewCon in Portland. The good news is that you don't have to be there to win it. Uh, Details about the drawing are at highgravitybrew.com and on their Facebook page. It's an awesome system, arguably even better than what I've got. I'm a little jealous, to tell the truth. (laughs) It's got uh, two 15-gallon vessels, a Werthog EBC-130 controller, which is what I have, a Riptide pump, a Therminator plate chiller. It uh, includes the, the plumbing between the vessels and everything that you need except the ingredients and the electricity. And you know electric brewing can take the pain out of propane, and high gravity is the place to go for awesome gear. You can register online until Sunday, June 24th, and the system will be given away Saturday morning, June 30th. Uh, again, go to highgravitybrew.com or the High Gravity Facebook page to find out about the details about how you can win this awesome two-vessel electric system. And while you're there, uh, check out all the electric brewing systems and controllers at uh, family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. Well, the last time I talked to Dick Cantwell was in September of 2013 about starting a commercial brewery, and I can't believe it's been that long. But now Dick has written Eclectic Brewing. It's hard for me to say. Brewing, Eclectic Brewing. I've been talking about electric brewing so long. Uh, It's hard to say. (laughs) Uh, The book is called Brewing Eclectic IPA, Pushing the Boundaries of India Pale Ale. And it takes IPA to the next level. Dick Cantwell, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thanks. It's good to be back. Uh, it's been a couple of years since we talked, I guess. So uh, a bunch of stuff has happened these days. Uh, I'm in Seattle today, actually, but for Seattle Beer Week. But these days I live in San Francisco. And as of last summer, I'm part of a group, uh, including New Belgium and Out Beer Soul, that's taken over Magnolia Brewing Company there. And we have two locations, and that's pretty much how I spend my days in those two locations. Uh and lately, uh, sort of tying into what we're here today to talk about, my book that just came out, Eclectic, Brewing Eclectic IPA, uh, we're preparing for an event uh, surrounding the release of the book. So we've been brewing a bunch of these beers. Yesterday I was in there 
throwing rosemary into a mash and putting it in the whirlpool after having, you know, gone out by, in the dark of night to scavenge some from my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, today they're doing a cloudy New England cranberry IPA. We've got a guava habanero one coming up next week and a cucumber Meyer lemon one. So uh, these days I'm practicing what I preach. <laughs> and how's the response? How do people like them? Um, well, they, they're, they're intrigued. You know, Magnolia had a long history of specializing in English style ales and they were, you know, many of them were very good beers, but I think it's time to sort of bring things up to date. And I think, uh, even, you know, the regulars, the people who, who come in every day are the ones that you are most concerned about sort of shocking. And they've been very supportive. They've really been, have been enjoying, uh, drinking some of the new beers and I'm happy about that. So eclectic IPA is something that kind of it's a, a style or a category that goes across styles and categories, right? Yeah, it kind of does. I mean, it's 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 it's. I, I suppose it's under the subset of American IPA, but it, depending on what other specialty ingredient you're using, it could be a fruit beer or an herb and spice beer or a wood aged beer or something like that. So it does cover go across a lot of styles, but I think of it as sort of augmented IPA, IPA with some other specialty ingredient. Um, and, or IPA that's subjected to some other treatment like wood, which I mentioned, or maybe souring techniques, that kind of thing. So it's, it's the base beer, you know, uh, what we understand to be an IPA, a fairly strong, fairly hoppy pale ale uh, with these other tie-ins. Yeah, it's in reading your book, it's not that the IPA is compromised in any way by the addition of these ingredients. It's kind of like IPA plus. Well, that's the way I think of it, too. I mean, purists might say, oh, well, that's not really beer or that's not really IPA. But honestly, the whole craft, American craft interpretation of IPA is a bit of a riff on, you know, a class, what we the best we understand of a classic English style about which there's a fair amount of dispute anyway. So, you know, IPA was one of those styles that was taken up and rediscovered by American craft brewers in their search to sort of recreate some of the world's great beers. And, you know, I think one thing that's that's helped it along in the last couple of decades, last few decades, really, is the is the discovery and development of various fruity hop varieties. So that in itself makes it almost unidentifiable from the from the from its English forebears, you know, beginning with Cascade, moving on to Chinook and Centennial and then the more modern hops like Amarillo, Mosaic, Simcoe, Citra, the, the South southern hemisphere ones and, and onward and really that's where i think some of these specialty ingredients come in because so many of these hop varieties um because of their essential oil contents are evocative of some of these specialty ingredients they're evocative of fruits you know you often hear hop varieties described as as being redolent of mangoes or citrus or you know something else or or they're also her herbaceous hop varieties too so a lot of these beers, a lot of these hop varieties, I think, are just crying out for combination with some of the uh, other naturally occurring um, organisms that that tie into some of those flavors. So there's just there's just so much daylight these days. Yeah, I mean, there's we did a, a hop tasting last night. A friend and I did, uh, and you know, we were you would think that we were in the particular hops we were talking about. We would think we were talking about fruit salad rather than a beer. Uh, because of the characters that were coming out of these hops. So are there some rules? I mean, you talk in your book about getting together with a group of brewers uh, to kind of riff and and uh, combine ingredients kind of on the fly and to create some of these, you know, eclectic IPAs. Um, is there is there a methodology or what is your methodology in coming up with these different beers? I mean, how how do you get started? Well, that particular project was a sort of a, a, a home brewing camp where I had a group of people, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole bunch of specialty ingredients, several different hop varieties, and the understand the basic understanding that what we were there to make was an IPA. So we poured concentrates and juices into little cups and tasted them and rubbed herbs between our fingers and cut up shiso leaves and whatever else and and picked some some specialty ingredients we wanted to use. At the same time, we were rubbing different hop varieties to see what combinations we could come up with. And that's that's really sort of a microcosmic way of of uh, gaining the inspiration for some of these beers. I mean, I think 
one of the points that I try to make in the book is that inspiration is all around us. I mean, walking down the specialty uh, produce aisle in a, in, a, in a supermarket or even better yet, at some sort of an ethnic market, you know, you're going to see things that just sort of jump out at you that, that would, would go well, would just have interesting and bold flavors that would, I think, go, go well in a, in a beer of excess like IPA, especially when you combine them to in some sort of harmony or um, concordance with, with specific hop varieties. Uh, ditto going into a spice market or something like that, or just walking down the street and seeing what's growing in, in, in your neighbor's yard. Um, you know, there, it's just all over the place. So sometimes it's sort of a lightning bolt. Like uh, I tell the story in the book about when I, when I got the idea to do the Jasmine IPA that I used to brew at Elysian, uh, was in a judging session, and one of the judges was reminded of jasmine tea in the hop in the hop variety that he was, that he was picking up. I mean, sometimes it's it's something that hits you right like that. Sometimes it's something that you set out consciously to do. But a lot of the time, it's just things that you encounter in just sort of normal roving around and reading and cooking and whatever else we do in our daily lives. So, are, are you, what is your philosophy more like? You you want to make something that is kind of a happy marriage of all these ingredients, so that you maybe can't exactly tell what's what, or or do you in some of these beers do you want to a, a, an IPA or an, an eclectic IPA to scream cranberries, you know, uh, to feature that one ingredient? Well, you could do you could do it either way. I mean, sometimes an effective ingredient is something that you almost can't put your finger on when you're when you're tasting it sort of in the background. And sometimes you need to be told, you know, in, in a beer description or something like that, that something's even in there. But then sometimes things scream. And then there are degrees of screaming, too. I mean, one of the one of the recipes I have in the book is for uh, the, the Guava Habanero IPA that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and we're brewing that for the second time coming up. And chilies are, you know, they're, 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 uh, uh, first an acquired taste. Not everybody likes them in beer, but there are degrees, you know, some people think that chilies like hops, the more, the better and all that. But when we made this beer, um, we hung the bag of chilies. These were, uh, chopped up habaneros. We used about a pound and a quarter for a seven barrel batch, hung it in the tank and just kept tasting it. Um, and then when we felt like it was the right degree, we pulled that bag out and it was only in there for about an hour. Mm, so wow. they're screaming, they're screaming and they're screaming. <laughs> I, I've had some habanero beers that made me want to scream. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, overdone, I, I don't get it, but you know, habanero, hot chilies are something that combine really well with fruit. You know, they're, they're terrific, you know, hot peach salsas, mango salsas, that kind of thing. The combination of, of sweetness and heat can be a really nice thing. And, but it's a matter of degree, and it's a matter of balance. So, and, and habaneros they, have their own fruity flavor. I mean, before you get the heat, you get they the do. fruit. Yeah, that's one reason I like habaneros in particular, because they have such a wonderful flavor. I mean, I, I much prefer them to, to jalapenos, which have sort of a waxy quality for me. And they have their place, of course, but but overall, I, I just love the flavor of habaneros. Have you tried the Carolina Reaper yet? I've experienced them. I haven't brewed with them. <laughs> Talk about moderation there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I tried a little bitty piece of one, and I was surprised at how fruity the thing was before the you know the top of my head came off with the you know the the heat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, chilies are an interesting thing in themselves. You know, they've got they they, they exactly that. I mean, some of them have. They, there's always a bit of a sweetness to to any pep to any pepper like that, and then and then depending on the degree of the heat and the, the style of the heat and the flavor. I mean, there's so many elements just within that. And I think that that really is one of the things that that ties in with those essential oils that I'm mentioning before a little obscurely in connection with hops. I mean, terpenes are a big word these days, but mainly in connection with weed. You know, if you mm. Google it, that's all, all you're going to find. But and, and I think a lot of people think that that's that they're restricted to there. That's it. That's all there. That's that's the only place you find them. But it, it isn't true. They're in everything. You know, the. A hop description, an analytical hop description will have a listing of all the different uh, terpenes, you know, myrcene, linalool, eumuline, all these things. And 
these these things also occur in fruits and in vegetables and in spices and in you know the the excretions of butterflies that they use to keep birds away i mean these are these are really intense organic substances that are very active flavor compounds that you know like i don't think people paid too much attention to the content in hops before but with all these fruity varieties the makeup of them can be described um you know not just fancifully and in those fruit salad words you mentioned, but, but also in terms of the chemical breakdown. Mm. It's not an absolute roadmap to how it's going to turn out in a beer, but it's one of many tools that you can use. Well, let's talk about uh, technique here. Uh, first of all, I'm assuming that you just want to build a good, solid IPA that's good to drink on its own. But then what strategies do you use to actually physically add these ingredients to your brew? Well, it depends on what the ingredient is. And one of the things in the book, uh, there are a bunch of charts in there that list as many ingredients in the different families of ingredients, you know, herbs, spices, fruits, vegetables, whatever, that I could think of. And then different points in the process that it's appropriate to add them and the appropriate form. Because if you if you look at citrus, you've got, okay, just going from the outside in, you've got the zest. You can use that. You're probably not going to use the the you know the, the membrane and and the, the white stuff underneath the outer edge of the peel, but the juice is another thing you could use. So and you know you could say that about various other things too. And of course, some plants generate multiple types of spice. I mean you know there's uh, 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 nutmeg and mace. You know they come from the same from the same plant. Um, so. There, there are different times in the process. Like I mentioned earlier, the rosemary IPA we were making yesterday at Magnolia. So the first thing we did was we cut up a bunch of the branches and we threw them in the mash to flavor the wort. And so, you know, immediately on mashing, you're, you know, you're smelling this, this rosemary aroma in the air, which carries over to the kettle and keeps going with that. Then we added more. We deneedled the rest of what we had and we bagged that and put that in the whirlpool. So there are different places where it's appropriate for different functions. And in that case, I was looking for some of the woodiness, some of the astringency, and some of the, some of the resinous uh, qualities that would get, get into the wort, and then some of the more delicate aroma that would, that would uh, I mean, just the way you use hops. So <clears throat> it's a matter of form and, and time of introduction. You know, some things are so delicate that you probably wouldn't add them on the hot side at all. You'd you'd put some things into either into the fermenter or even or even when you've transferred over to the next tank or 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 you know some right pre, immediately prior to bottling. Now in that case, of course, you have to be careful that the beer <clears throat> is stable. So you might you know use some sort of a pasteurized product so it can't so it can't uh, continue to ferment. But there are any number of times and pl- and points in the process that things can be introduced and any number of forms that they come in and, and it's appropriate to use for different functions. There's a local brewer here who, uh, Jesse Gagnon, who uh, made a blood orange IPA and he used uh, blood orange puree in the, uh, in the serving vessel, basically. Uh, so he had the, the, yeah. the luxury of, of keeping that cold enough to where it's not going to wake up and cause problems. Uh, but the, it was interesting that the, that the, the, the hops, uh, the bitterness from the hops combined with the blood orange flavor to create more of, of kind of a grapefruit, you know, more right. a, a bite. Uh, so that was an, it's an right. interesting uh, example of a good marriage between the, the two. Yeah, citrus, uh, citrus is a natural with so many of these citrusy hop varieties, you know, Northwestern hop varieties in particular. Um, but as, as, but then we, <clears throat> but then there are the South, South you know, the uh, New Zealand ones, the Southern hemisphere ones, you know, Nelson Savan, I remember the first time I smelled that, that was amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's Sauvignon Blanc, it's gooseberries, you know, and, and I, the last beer I brewed at Elysian before I left there was a gooseberry IPA. Um, so there are a lot of tie-ins like that, but there are also things that, that might be a little surprising, that might seem discordant on the surface, but end up kind of like that guava habanero thing, that end up making sort of an interesting marriage, an interesting combination, a bit in contrast with the different elements. And you, you mentioned several times in the book, you know, like uh, tomatoes may not be the best candidate for making IPAs, but, you know, what the heck? If you want to make a tomato beer, go ahead. <laughs> I had a tomato beer at Peter Buchart's new brewery, Purpose, in Fort Collins, 
And what he was setting out to do was, um, you know, if you go to Spain, one of the uh, very common appetizers that, that you'll get is pan de tomate, you know, which is just bread, toasted bread with a garlic clove and, and tomatoes cut in half. And you rub the garlic over the bread and then you basically use the use the toasted bread as a grater to, to put the put the tomato into it. And he wanted to make a, a beer that was reminiscent of that. Hmm. And it wasn't an IPA. Peter's not a big hop head, but it was a it was a, basically a Belgian style, and it was fascinating. Um, I still don't think tomatoes great for IPA, though. <laughs> a little too acidic, maybe. Uh, it's also got, you know, it's got that tomatoey aroma. Sometimes, you know, there <clears throat> there are some off flavors that are described as tomatoey or or brothy. You know, that's sometimes sometimes there are associative elements that are enough to just sort of discount things. And sometimes it's a shame, you know, like Kim, my girlfriend, you know, she doesn't like, uh, she doesn't like wine, white wine that has very much oak character because it reminds her of diacetyl. Uh. And, you know, it works in my favor if she's drinking a nice glass of white burgundy and decides she doesn't want it. <laughs> but um, it's a shame, you know, because that's one of the wonderful elements of some of those things. But, uh, you know, we, we carry a lot of, we carry baggage, good and bad. Yeah, and you you mentioned also in the book that that you you sh- you personally shy away from some ingredients that do mimic uh, common off flavors that are recognized in beer. Right, right. I think you have to be careful about that. But <clears throat> recognizing that, you know, it's so much of so much of the delicacy of conception and execution is walking that line. You know, coming right up to the edge of where something might not be appropriate and. And and be and recognizing where it is and being able to figure out how to keep from crossing it, you know there there are esters that are that are um, wonder lovely delicate in very small quantities like ethyl acetate, but but if you get too much of ethyl too much ethyl acetate, it's like nail polish remover. Mm-hmm. But a, a very light amount is a is a nice sort of like touch of pear. I mean, really, as brewers, we deal in you know we deal in spoilage, we deal in the flavors of degradation. And, um, you know, fruits that are unripe are one way, fruits that are overripe are another. And, you know, they're the same thing, but they contribute different things. And once again, it's when you want to eat them or when, if you're making beer with them, when you want to use them. And you, you have lots of recipes in here, and some of them, you know, you, you've, you've uh, categorized them in, like, fruits and vegetables and spices and, and uh, wood and, and chocolate and, you know, coffee. Uh, but some of them cross the line, like this red spruce IPA, which has red currant <laughs> and spruce. I think that sounds good, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> You you mentioned radical brewing, uh, you know, by Randy Mosher is you know something that was uh, inspirational. I think this this book is inspirational in a similar way in that you know these are ideas that they just look good on paper. Yeah, well, I brewed a, no, a number of a number of those recipes, but honestly, not all of them. And that's one that I can't wait to do. I've ordered the spruce, but uh, suddenly the red currant syrup that I had dried up. But I'll get more. I'll do it. But you know, I I think yeah, you're right. I mean, I think. Part of the part of the point of so much of what I write about beer is just trying to get people to think, you know, having them look at things in new ways, uh, like the the book I wrote about how to start your own brewery. I'm I'm not an expert on all the technical and construction and regulatory aspects of doing that, but I think having the experience that I did, I was able to sort of remind people or sort of call people's attention to some of the things they may not have thought about, and that's what I'm trying to do with this book too, is make the point that, uh, you know, we, we all have different currents of experience and expertise. And um, I, this is not, this is by no means the authoritative book on anything, but it is a collection of ideas that I've had and a, and a, a body of knowledge that I've just sort of ruminated on. And I think it could be used as a springboard, and that's the intention, be used as a springboard for anybody who reads it uh, in the conception of some of the beers that they that they enjoy. I also think that this book is something that is something that the general reader might enjoy too, just for the sake, the, the way people read cookbooks or, mm. or books about qu- different cuisines and flavor combinations that they may not, you know, understand or have thought in depth about. So that's, that's sort of the idea. It's, just, it's supposed to just provoke thought, get people started. 
Now, I, t- I told you through email that I was planning on brewing the uh, rosemary beer, the rosemary IPA. Yeah. Because I've got fresh rosemary growing in the garden. Uh, the other, the second on my list from the book was the Cucumber Squeeze IPA with cucumber and Meyer lemon. I'm brewing that next week. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That just seemed like fun. I, br- I made cucumber beer before, um, but I think the combination of that with uh, the citrus, especially the citrus that's sort of a, uh, you know, Meyer lemon is sort of balanced, balanced between tart and, and sweet. You know, it's got some sweetness, but it's definitely got some tartness, and it's just a beautiful color, of course. Um, but that one looked like fun. I thought, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I've ordered in a couple of boxes of cucumbers. First thing we'll do is peel them, and I think we'll throw those peels in the mash. Why not? <laughs> and then uh, I'll borrow the big, the big sort of hand, handheld blender, the the big one, you know, the the one that's like three and a half feet tall, and puree the flesh of the cucumbers in a bucket i'll probably i think i should probably seed them first i think the seeds might get in the way if i don't yeah your your equipment might thank you well we would be putting the puree directly into the fermenter so it would be a matter of uh you know what gets transferred and what gets broken down in the course of fermentation i don't know i think i think i'll i think i'll cut a cucumber open and taste the different elements and make my decisions then See there you go. We're seeing it. We're seeing this beer being born, you know, right here. So, <laughs> right. The, the, and this is one a, a good one to illustrate that you said you 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 know you're going to put the peel in the mash, you know, for fun more than anything else maybe. Uh, but then you you know you use the flesh later in the process, and and similarly you divide up the different components of the lemon as well. Right. I'll be ze- we'll be zesting it and adding that uh, probably at. Uh, um, well, either, I'm not sure, either, either in the whirlpool at the very end of that, I don't want to drive off too much aroma, uh, or in the fermenter. And then we'll, and since I've got all that juice, we'll juice it and put the juice in when we transfer it into the conditioning tank. And there's a fennel IPA, which <laughs> is intriguing. I love fennel. Um, <laughs> I recently made a fennel I've I've been given a little pause on that one. I I uh, recently made a fennel Belgian style double beer that I thought was delicious, but boy, it was hard to sell. Huh. I'm not sure everybody likes fennel as much as I do. Now, is that kind of a is that kind of a licorice kind of thing? Yeah, mildly licorice, mildly licorice. Um, I I often I'll put some fennel in my morning juice. You know, I have one of those masticating juicers. So I typically do a blend of uh, fennel and apples and mint and ginger and turmeric and maybe a little citrus to brighten it up. Uh, But one thing I've noticed about fennel, too, is if you let it sit for a while, it gets much more strongly anisey. And if, if if it's fresh and you juice it then, it's just sort of a touch of that flavor. But it gets more concentrated later. And I have to say I like it better in the more subtle version. Hmm. So I think that's what I would strive for in using it for an IPA. And uh, and we touched on the on the maple beer, which uh, maple beers are delicious. Yeah, that one was, um, I got a lot of help from people. You know, these days we have some really, really interesting brewers out there who are doing a lot of things with foraging and using a lot of native ingredients. And I had an interesting discussion uh, via email with the guy from Fanta Flora in North Carolina. You know, he, he, I had a really good maple IPA at his place one time when I was out, uh, out in Asheville, uh, you know, visiting the new Belgian brewery and going to brewery and going to some of the other local breweries. Um, you know, and of course at the appropriate season using, I, I suggest that you could substitute, um, you know, raw maple sap for brewing liquor, because, you know, if you've ever tasted that coming right off a tree, it's fairly mild, but mm-hmm. you get a very small amount of concentration in the course of the boil, I think. Uh, but, you know, because some most of us can't don't have access to that kind of thing, and of course it's a seasonal um, product as well, you know, I suggested just sort of thinning out some maple syrup in water and doing it that way. I've actually sat in on a brewing session where uh, we used... Uh, uh, maple sap, and uh, we took a, a gravity reading, and I was surprised at how little sugar there actually is in, in sap. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever made maple syrup. I haven't. I've just read about it, but yeah, they cook it down like I forget what the multiple is, but I mean, it has to be really boiled down to get to the concentration that we buy in a in that little bottle. That's one reason it's so expensive. 
Yeah, I think it's like 40 to 1 or something like that, or I, I could be something wrong. Something like that, yeah. 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 Uh, you, speaking of of herbs, you, you do talk about uh, uh, using the herb of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, evolving legality uh, in the book. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, people are, are, are of a couple of different minds about that. I figured it was something that I should treat. And I've never actually done that myself, but I talked to a bunch of people who have. And, you know, when it comes right down to it, in order to preserve the THC aspect of and, and have it be psychoactive, and of course I stress in the book that this is strictly for home brewers who live in, you know, states where, where such a thing is legal, you know, professional brewers aren't allowed to do anything like that. Um, and in fact, um, Matt, we recently made a, a bunch of San Francisco breweries recently made a bunch of uh, beers using cannabis terpenes in them that had no THC whatsoever. And we all got letters from TTB saying, this, this is not an approved ingredient. Stop doing it. Hmm. And of course, we have to comply. But anyway, back to the back to the project at hand. Uh, I did consult a, a guy who is uh, connected with a home brewing club in uh, in Colorado, Hop Barley and the Ailers. And they, in their competitions, they actually have a a category devoted to, you know, THC active beers. And, uh, you know, essentially what you have to do, just like when you're cooking with it, you have to volatilize it in some sort of um, um, either fat or alcohol. So I give some information about both. And the fat for beer, you know, you'd have to use you can't, you know, you can uh, get it absorbed into olive oil, for for example, but but then you're putting a bunch of olive oil in the beer, uh, so it's it's a bit tricky, um, and that would be difficult for head retention and all that kind of stuff. Good for yeast health, but not for other aspects. Mm-hmm. And then I, the the technique that I sort of settle on is is using some sort of an alcohol infusion and putting it in there. But once again, you're dealing with minute amounts, and it would be very easy to overdo it uh, for people who do smoke weed, most people just sort of say, I think I'm going to smoke some weed and, and drink a beer <laughs> and not go to all that trouble. <laughs> but there's always the challenge and the novelty. <laughs> right. And at this point, 20, roughly 20% of the U.S. population lives in places where it's legal. So I figured it was worth treating. Well, ma- allegedly, uh, you know, we, we voted to legalize uh, medical marijuana here in Arkansas, but they can't get their act together on approving the people who grow it and the people who sell it. So, uh, you know, we're still kind of in limbo. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a balancing act, no matter where you are and what you're trying to do. Yeah. It's an interesting subject these days. Now, uh, you talk about coffee and chocolate or, uh, cacao nibs, I guess, more specifically. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a brewery up here in Northwest Arkansas, Bentonville Brewing Company. They make a coffee beer or a coffee IPA and they manage through a partnership with a local roaster and using an exotic bean that I, I'm afraid I can't remember, they actually make a, a a coffee IPA that doesn't look like a porter. You know, it's a it's a lighter uh-huh. colored beer uh, and the fruitiness of this bean uh, really comes out. It, it's not slap you in the face coffee beer. But the fruitiness of this coffee bean that they selected really uh, accentuates and complements the, you know, the fruity uh, hops uh, that they use as well. Yeah, I think the, the, the bitter aspect, the bitter and fruity aspects <coughs> of, uh, of coffee can be employed that way. And I think, you know, you bring up a very good, uh, you know, sort of precedent of just about partnering with a local coffee roaster. I mean, I, you know, I live in Seattle. I have lived in Seattle for nearly 30 years now. And. I know coffee, sort of, but I don't know it nearly as well as my friends, the coffee roasters. So when, I, when I've when i wanted to make any kind of a coffee beer, I'll generally go to one of my friends and talk to them about the different aspects of different beans, and we'll do some tasting and come up with something. But there's a, there's a bitter aspect both to, to chocolate and to coffee that I think, once again, sort of cry out to be combined with the bitterness of hops. And then that fruitiness, once again, you've got the fruity aspects of hops, too. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a more subtle game. It's more difficult, I think. I think most of the IPAs I've tasted that have coffee or chocolate in them are not. You know, they're, the, the, the ingredients sort of overshadow the hops. They make it maybe something other than an IPA. But 
you know, well turned. I, I see no reason why it couldn't be really effective and interesting. It sounds like you've had one that is. Yeah, what's what's your favorite strategy of getting coffee in into a beer and more specifically into these? Well, it's a trick, obviously, because coffee's dark. So um, over the years, as I've as I've used coffee and beer, you know, the, the early coffee beers were just sort of coffee combined with beer. OK, you know, you basically pour coffee that's already made or you'd make do sort of a coffee. Uh, you know, you'd make coffee in your kettle or something like that without boiling it too much to keep it from being too harsh. But of course, there's a darkness to it. So I think probably the most effective way would be to do a limited contact time with the beans themselves. You might get a little bit of you might get a little bit of color, but I think you're probably going to get more flavor with them. And the the advantage you would have with bagging them and hanging them in the tank that way, too, is you could monitor how it was going, how the flavor was developing, how much color was being introduced. And then just as I did with those habaneros before with that other beer, pull them out. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you feel like you've gotten the right amount and before you've gotten too much color because I, you know, but these days, of course, we also have so-called black IPA. So I do have a recipe in the book for a darker beer, a darker IPA style beer that isn't worried so much about the introduction of color, but I'm most intrigued by a pale beer that does sort of flirt with that bitterness and maybe gets a touch of color. And you talk about, uh, uh, sour and uh, wood aged uh, IPAs as well uh, that's you know that's more interesting territory that uh, you know you're you're going to be find trying to find a balance to to make sure that it's still an IPA sure well i'm i'm surprised there aren't more wood aged IPAs you know the the sort of classic IPA story however true it is you know is that strong hoppy beers were put in oak casks and shipped across the ocean to india and, you know, it's just the fact that they that oak had its had its presence um, in contact with the wood should have affected the flavor. So I think I also think it's a wonderful introduction of flavor to to an IPA um, sour sour treatments, you know, is, is a bit of a navigating act because um, uh, part of the reason, part of the very reason those beers survived that long trip was because they were both high in alcohol and high in hop bitterness. And both of those things are natural preservatives and discourage beer spoiling bacteria like lactobacillus, which are the very thing, the, one of the very things that makes sour beers sour. So sometimes it's a matter of kind of fooling the beer or doing sort of a late combination mm. uh, of, the, of, of beers or of of treatments to sort of introduce some of those elements without affecting the fermentation. So you, for example, you could do a blend, you could do, you know, blend um, sour beer that you've made some other way, whether by aging in wood with, you know, resident microflora or doing some sort of a kettle sour and blending in a percentage of those beers into a beer that otherwise would qualify as an IPA to give it a little bit of an extra tang. Or another thing you could do is do, um, um, dry hopping. You could, you could introduce a lot of your hops late once the sour fermentation is essentially concluded. Uh, it's not an IPA, but I think sort of just the, the example I always think of as being most successful with that technique is the New Belgium Le Terroir. Mm. You know, it's, it's not an IPA, but it is a sour beer that's, that's heavily dry hopped later on, and it has wonderful qualities of both. And I don't see why that couldn't be managed with a with a beer that does more closely qualify as an IPA. Well, this is the book. I, I, I as I said, I really enjoyed uh, reading it, and I, it really has given me a lot of inspiration. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of with uh, you know the juicy IPAs, which we didn't talk about, or you don't talk about much of the book, the New England kind. No, I don't. Um, not so, not because I'm trying to avoid the subject, but. Uh, Brewers Publications has the intention of, you know, running, doing a whole series of books on IPAs. This is just the first one. And I think that's probably one that would be in the American IPA book rather than this, because those different dry hopping techniques and all that stuff really aren't, don't really fall into the categories that I, that I lay out. Um, I think they're really interesting beers in the, in their sort of revolutionary dry hopping techniques. You know, I'm I'm I don't really see the point of adding ingredients to make beer cloudy when it doesn't need to be. 
I think it really should be more about the flavor. But I'm, you know, I'm not adamantly opposed to these things. I am kind of intrigued by how divisive this whole thing has become. <laughs> but, um, but I, but I think um, I do have the recipe for that cranberry New England IPA, so a cloudy one. I do, I do sort of tip my hat that way. But since they don't have other specialty ingredients in them, that wasn't something that I felt like I needed to really treat. Sure. Nicely done, Dick. Way to <laughs> way to stay out of it. <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm all for them. I'm I'm, I'm kind of an, like I said, I'm kind of mystified by how angry some of my friends are about them. They're like, I, you know, one friend of mine told me that he had told his boss that that he would quit rather than brew a cloudy IPA. And it's like, well, you know, there's room for everything. I mean. Some things come and go. Maybe in five years, we, people won't be drinking them, but maybe they will. And there will be something new coming along. I mean, so what? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I, I think they're tasty. I've had, I've had some really tasty ones. So uh, yeah, yeah, I've had some bad ones too, but you know, I I, I enjoy them. Well, there you go. Well, this has been fun. Uh, I hope that it's that it's not you know another. Uh, however long, four and a half years or whatever, before we uh, have an excuse to get together and talk again. Well, we'll see what's that, we'll see what's going on. We've got, you know, some pretty interesting projects going on in Magnolia. I hope some of those will be newsworthy later on. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm always open. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for having me. I enjoyed it. Well, thanks again to Dick. It really is an inspirational book, Brewing Eclectic IPAs. And I'm not just saying that because Brewer's Publications sponsored this episode. <laughs> I swear that wasn't on purpose. It just came up on the schedule. I was like, well, what's, the, what's the ad for this week? Oh, it's that. <laughs> Which is fine. You know, my journalistic integrity is on the line here. It's <laughs> but I hope you know that I wouldn't, I wouldn't steer you wrong. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't accept ads from stuff I don't believe in. Uh, this is the last show until July, as uh, we take June off for family vacations and homebrew con and such. Hope, hope to see you there in Portland. And if you see Steve and me wandering around, stop us and say hi. And uh, as I always say, I'll buy you a beer in the hospitality suite. You know, it's beers, beers free in the hospitality suite. That's why it's, a, it's, a, it's why it's a clever thing to say. But there's beer involved, so you know. Uh, in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies like that bonus video I talked about at the beginning of the show coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, extract brewing and partial mashing, stepping into all grain, low-tech lagering, and decoction mashing, introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts, our logbooks, and uh, you get free stickers. And also remember those new pint silicone, silicone? It's silicone, not silicon, right? Silicone, pint glasses. Uh, Come in at basicbrewingshop.com. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson, Basic Brewing Radio. It's a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.